Hey everyone, it's Nathan, president of Saybrook University. Listen, it's great to be back here with another episode of Saybrook Insights. When I came to Saybrook in 2014, I was drawn to our institution for its rich, rich intellectual legacy. And of course, psychology has played a front and center role here uh, for over 50 years and is very much entwined uh, with that intellectual history. We've had amazing scholars who've either founded Saybrook, taught here, or were connected in different ways. I mean, really, it isn't too many institutions that can boast having had individuals like Abraham Maslow, Carl Rogers, and his daughter, Natalie. James Bugenthal it was in our orbit, and all of these folks were major connections, founders, or faculty. Saybrook also has a rich legacy where research, specifically qualitative research, is concerned. Names like Clark Moustakis, Amadeo Georgi, are among some of the leading lights who led the way with respect to qualitative research. Now, this is kind of a nerding out moment for me back in 2014 when I was thinking of the presidency here at Saybrook, but I recall the days in my research courses where I was learning about uh, statistics and qualitative methods reading about Saybrook University as one of the major players in this space. Remember, now it's a mainstay, this qualitative stuff. But back in the 1970s, qualitative research was as taboo as a Lenny Bruce routine. But there is one person who often stands out in Saybrook's historical timeline for his teaching, his prodigious insights and writings, for his approach to therapy, now referred to as existential humanistic psychology, which importantly is the mainstay of Saybrook's legacy. He opined, wrote on everything from beauty to creativity to the search for meaning to freedom and destiny. In many circles, he's considered to have been one of America's most important philosophers and psychologists for his rather unorthodox yet compelling ways of looking at the human being and our search for meaning. His name? Dr. Rollo May. I'm going to let my guest, Dr. Edmund Delowitz, talk more about Rollo, especially his history and impact. But I must note that Rollo himself, like me, came from the Midwest. Initially, he was from uh, Michigan and Ohio. In fact, a little town called Ada, Ohio, a town where I lived, an incredibly small town at that, located near a small city called Lima. That's my true hometown. And then beyond, out into the world, he went uh, to explore the work and his intellectual life. And his life was, as were his ideas unorthodox, but his upbringing reminds me often of so many of us who grew up in the Midwest, seeking, longing, looking for opportunities to make a difference, and then looking at the broader world for answers. Yet often, like Rollo, I think most of us found more questions, and that's exactly how it should be. In addition to my conversation with Ed, you can read more about Dr. May in his authorized biography written by historian Robert Abzug, A-B-Z-U-G. Bob wrote a very compelling, uh, very thorough biography on Rollo May, and it's worth the read. All right, let's get moving with Dr. Ed Mendelowitz. Well, I think you're all in for a treat today. We are joined by Dr. Ed Mendelowitz. Ed, what a joy it is to have you here as a guest. Before we get started, tell us about yourself, your personal history a little bit as it relates to psychology, how you wound up at Saybrook University. We're, rest assured, we'll get into Rollo May in just a few short moments, but I'd love to hear about your personal journey uh, on your way to Saybrook. My journey has always been a somewhat restless one. You know, I think I grew up with an, enough um, of a struggle that uh, psychology became something of interest to me from, from an early start. And uh, as I was going to uh, college, you know, uh, everybody who didn't know what they wanted really to do going forward ended up, it seemed, majoring in psychology. And I did as well. But, uh, and I took it somewhat seriously, uh, but I found a lot of my learning was taking place, you know, with uh, dog-eared copies of Maslow and 
R.D. Lang I found in bookshops nearby. And Carl Rogers was somebody I discovered very early on. He, he was a very important early voice, you know, uh, in my first uh, sort of undergraduate year. So I got there without any great sense of direction, I think. Uh, but I was working out my own, you can call it inner jihad, you know. And when I... I I graduated and worked for a few years in counseling, but I realized I did not know enough. And so I resolved to go back to school. I wanted the West Coast. I wanted a, a non-traditional program. So I ended up at, at uh, what was known in, in those days as CSPP. That's where I ran into Rollo. And he was also teaching at Sabra. So uh, I, I knew that. And I knew at that point he wasn't only going to affiliate himself with schools that uh, he felt were worthy of his time. I knew some of the faculty because I had already tapped into the JHP, you know. I read that journal from an early point. And so that, that's how gradually I, I got you know, to a kind of humanistic sensibility. And of course, you know, Sabra uh, has always been a, a, an extremely important place. And I, I see you, you, you've uh, done a really good job of uh, just developing the university in, in, in the years that you've been there. Thank you. I'm glad to, to be a part and uh, the more so uh, from this particular angle. That's right. I, you know, and uh, for full disclosure to the audience, uh, Ed has been in touch with me since uh, the early springtime, I, we're really winter, uh, talking about Dr. May's legacy and his wife, Georgia, just recently passed away. So there's a lot uh, that Saybrook and Ed are working on together uh, to help advance uh, the important work that Rollo's done. So that's a good segue, I think, into, Ed, you've got a big task ahead of you to be talking about who is Rollo May, right? Like, why is he so important to the discipline of psychology? And you only get like a few minutes, but it's like, that's the task. And it, it's a gargantuan one, but I think you can do it. So fill in our listeners on this, because I think, you know, we, as, as we get further out in history, right, the, the, his, his light and many others start to dim just a bit, not because they're not worthwhile, but because of uh, history moving forward. And, I think we're trying to really also call out his incredible contributions to uh, not just psychology, but also to Saybrook's lineage. So, yeah, if you could talk about who he is and why he's so important to psychology, that'd be great. When I arrived uh, years ago in Berkeley at CSPP, this would have been like 78. And uh, it wasn't until I got there that I realized uh, Rollo May would teach a course out of his living room at CSPP. Uh, once a year. I think he was doing something similar with Saybrook. And uh, I resolved to take that course. I, I can't say exactly why, uh, but, you know, it had something to do with, that. Uh, I think, that U2 uh, song, you know, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I, I, I don't know why I um, intuited that it would be, you know, Rollo. Yeah. But I, I remember jumping through a bunch of hoops helping out with this is before the computer I was you know but I would help out with registration of other students so I could register beforehand and therefore get into that class a year earlier than I otherwise would have mm. and uh, that was unusual behavior for me I, I was um, seemingly you know determined to get into that class and I remember arriving late on that first evening at his home and uh, I was squeezed with a few others into this alcove opposite where he was sitting in this very pleasant, though far from ostentatious uh, living room. And uh, he began to introduce this case conference in what he was calling existential humanistic psychotherapy. He was trained as an analyst. He, uh, he could have used a bunch of credentials, but he, he was using this particular term at this point in time. And he said, you know, nobody is prepared to, this evening, of course, to present a case. So let's talk a little bit about what People, what psychotherapy is and what we're trying to um, accomplish through psychotherapy. And I noticed about him that, um, you know, the usual suspects raised their hands and were eager to make a point with this famous, very distinguished looking man. Uh, and he listened and took down some notes, but he, he was especially looking for not the, the usual suspects, the, their responses. You know, he, so he said, well, what, is, what about some of you others? 
I was a little shy in those days. I don't think I was planning to say anything, you know, uh, on that particular occasion. But a few more responses came. And then I see him looking sort of directly at me in the opposite corner in this little alcove. And he says, what about some of you wise, silent people over there in the corner? And I felt like I had to say something, you know, and I was working in a prison at that particular point, a very interesting range of experiences that I was sort of immersed in. And, uh, you know, I said to him, I used to think that therapy was about allaying anxiety, but I see here in working with many of these inmates uh, that um, the problem is that uh, some of them don't experience enough anxiety at all. At, at least at a conscious level, interesting. They act it out, and uh, the the insight is not there. And he just listened, took some more notes. But later on, he came back to me, and he said, "You're the one that works in a prison, is that right?" And I, I said, "Yeah." And he said, "So you say that um, you know therapy ought to be about the alleviation of anxiety?" But he said, "Maybe in a better world that would be so, but not in this world." He said, I think anxiety is necessary for awareness. And that's where our com the conversation began. At the end of the evening, he said something interesting. He said, um, so now let me say a few words about what I think psychotherapy ought to be. And how many of you have read The Divine Comedy? A couple of hands went up. Not many. Not, not mine. And, and he said, well, that's the trouble with you students at CSPP. You know how to read but you don't. <laughs> he said, and, and then he talked about Dante's descent into hell, you know, and he said, this is psychotherapy. It's, it's hard work and you need a guide. And, and, and that is the role of Virgil, you know, in the divine comedy. And, and, yeah. and as you go through the, the, the concentric circles of hell with a guide who points things out, once you then return to earth and then you, you know, you attend more toward whatever your vision of uh, the upper uh, octaves might be. In his case, it's, it's this image of Beatrice, right? And um, at that point, though, you're on your own. Your guide uh, takes uh, their leave because the, the journey is, is yours alone. You know, and uh, this was really important. So I, the next day or two, you know, I found a used bookshop along Telegraph Avenue and, uh, and found this beautiful hardbound copy of the Divine Comedy, you know, with William Blake's illustrations. Uh, oh, wow. Yes. I, I still own it. It's a special book to me. And Ed, I mean, inquiry minds want to know, did you read the whole thing? <laughs> uh, you, probably then I did. Probably then I did. <laughs> But I, um, <laughs> when I think back on it, it's, it's just several lines. And it's those illustrations of blanks and uh, how, oh, yeah. how he turns us on as well, right? Well, and it's, it's such a, an interesting way to tie that in, right, in terms of the visual effect. I, when I've read it before, I, you know, and, and then the, the light bulb went off as he said that, right? You know, as you recalled him saying that. What a what a beautiful way to put that into a really uh, visually illustrative manner. You know, I mean, just really, really powerful. I Before you go on, I do want to kind of pause for a second and get a couple definitions from you for our audience, because, you know, we're, we're going to have lay folks out there who maybe are interested in psychology but aren't sure. And then, of course, we have uh, many of our colleagues. So when you say existential humanistic psychology— what does that mean for the layperson who's out there? So I, I think humanistic psychology is founded in psychology proper as, as a reaction against uh, more orthodox systemized systems, notably psychoanalysis and behavioral therapy. And so the humanistic movement are some of those, you know, Rogers and Maslow and, uh, uh, and Rallo and others. Uh, and Henry Murray was a kind of sort of precursor to this, also at Old Saybrook. And they are they're concerned, we're, as we're concerned, with, with the, uh, the entire human being, not just uh, cognition, uh, not just the behavior, not just those things that can be seen or measured or, or neatly defined, 
And so if it's science, as Ernest Becker would have said, it's a human science. It's not going to be strictly empirically based including this, but not defined by this. There you and go. the holistic has to do with growth, I think. What is possible? The existential has to do with some awareness of what Rollo liked to call destiny, the limits of what human beings can do. We have freedom and we have also a limitation. And life is a sort of creative struggle of what we do uh, with our particular dilemma. Yeah. You know? the particular verse that uh, has been bequeathed to each of us. Humanism talks about possibility. Existentialism includes also the lower octaves and uh, the, the limitations. And I think to be truly human, you know, is to embrace, is to, I like to put in musical terms, is to hit on all the notes. Think there Beethoven. That's right. Think culture, you know. Yeah, great way to frame that, Ed. I appreciate that. And I know our audience will, too. So so thank you for that. So I apologize for interrupting you, but if you, you, you I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to add there in terms of his contributions uh, to psychology. I know they're, they're vast, so, uh, you know, certainly for those out there, we'll be including a list of his works uh, that are available. So, you know, we, we won't be able to recount them all here. But any other thoughts on that, Ed, before we get into a couple other areas? No, oh, it's, it's interesting that he chose to end that first class with this invocation of a literary work. Eugene Taylor, who's passed away, but used to teach it at Saybrook, and I, I know um, uh, ruffled a lot of uh, feathers, uh, mine at times too, but, uh, but uh, he and I became fr good friends before he passed away, and I, I learned a lot from him. And uh, one of the stories he told about being accused of espousing a literary psychology uh, by Skinner, and but to him, this was a, a kind of lofty way to think about our field, which, which taps into the humanities. Uh, Melville Hill himself went off for a couple of years, moved out to Western uh, Mass, uh, moved into, rented the house where Melville wrote Moby Dick. He became obsessed with Melville, who is one of the great sort of 19th century psychological geniuses. All the, the humanistic uh, concerns, you know, that uh, we at Saybrook uh, uh, are immersed in, you know, even awareness of the history of this country, that those are uh, slavery, the sort of um, uh, co-optation, assimilation, you know, of, of um, indigenous peoples and ways of being, you know, uh, Melville had a feeling for. He also had a feeling for what was possible for uh, human nature and human being, but one that always uh, kept in uh, mind uh, a more, what should we say, a complex view. William James talks about a universe two stories deep. That's what he's he's talking about. Very good. That's what we mean by existential humanistic, you know? And we realize, people like me, you know, you start reading Melville seriously, as May did and others, and you realize, I think it's Eugene O'Neill, the, the Irish the, uh, playwright who, who said, Irish-American, he said, you know, he says, we were, we writers were psychologists and very good ones long before psychology was invented. And it's true. They're exploring all of these different, different things, you know. It's core to the writing process, right? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And so, so this is, um, I, I think Rollo is a, a major uh, figure in, in this uh, contribution to this more literary psychology. He taps into philosophy, religion, literature, you know, as well as depth psychology, you know. I was going to say, yeah, yeah, depth psychology and definitely philosophy kind of as a collective discipline, if you want to include everything under that. Uh, psychology actually bloomed uh, from uh, you know, philosophy as a discipline. And, you know, I've heard in some corners uh, people saying that uh, uh, Rollo – was America's philosopher, at least during that period of time in which he was most active. I mean, would you consider that a fair assessment of his contributions uh, in general? I think uh, in psychology, the, the, the ones that, that I keep returning to, and I, I, I'm sure I'll never be done with, are uh, William James and Rollo May. 
is Georgia pointed out to me, Rollo admired uh, James, but they came from very different circumstances. Uh, James came from a very affluent family. You know, uh, he was a sort of Boston, sort of a blue blood of sorts, uh, but had a very turbulent life, you know, uh, personally, especially the first half. And uh, Rollo, as we learned from the, uh, the, the recent uh, biography, you know, ha has uh, uh, a much uh, tougher uh, time of things, but they all, they both have their own destinies. And I, I think they're both uh, quite turbulent souls and they both leave behind this astonishing body of work. Uh, it's important maybe to, to, to know that uh, when William James was born, his father, who was sort of a part of the transcendentalist scene, took his friend uh, Emerson home and had him sort of bless the child so that uh, Emerson it was William James' sort of godfather, you know. And I, I think it's important, you know, that, that we kind of um, um, appreciate, you know, our, our, our roots in uh, this sort of thread that wends its way through um, American uh, history that is uh, yeah, truly virtuous and, and um, ennobling and, um, and not easy. Indeed. Well, so, you know, as with any individual or way of uh, thinking, actually, and, and Rollo has, has, you know, as an individual has kind of casts a, a wide shadow uh, in a positive way, uh, there's the challenge of legacy, right? We look uh, back 50 years from now in 2072. You and I will likely not be with uh, the world, but what is Dr. May's legacy in 2072? That's a, a, an important question, and uh, I'm not sure I can give you an, uh, a, a good answer to that, Nathan. I, I think that's something, I, I will say this much, that's something that concerned him a lot as he got older. And uh, I think that was something that uh, that. Georgia tried to, you know, did impress upon me during our conversation from the last couple of years of her life, uh, this concern about his legacy. He, he had some concerns that things might become overly oriented on freedom as opposed to destiny. In other words, a particularly human freedom was one that had to, uh, you know, embrace destiny, uh, the, the limits of, of freedom. He uh, says in one of his books, he says, uh, freedom is the pause between stimulus and response. Uh, it's the break of the Sabbath, you know, that uh, allows us to choose to go slightly this way or slightly that way. But none of us is absolutely free to choose to go absolutely uh, wherever one wants, you know. There are limitations, absolutely, yes. Right. And so, I think the concern is that sort of more two-storied, uh, you know, as James would say, or multi-valent uh, uh, psychology, a uh, sense of humanism, does, does that um, survive? This was not a man who was, who was unduly concerned about his, his, his own name or legacy. I think more, he wasn't interested, as I wrote to you, he's not interested in groupies. He spotted me that first night, I realized he just sensed uh, some simpatico, you know? And I knew from that first night, I found that the teacher I was looking for. Right, I, you know, I think if any, any of those folks listening out there, but I, I know between us, Ed, that we have fairly similar feelings on this, that it's being in journey together, fellow travelers uh, in, in an intellectual space, right? That you're, you're not trying to necessarily situate us most faculty, especially, are not saying "think how I think," but I, you know, really trying to cultivate that sense of what can we build together? How do we construct this new way of thinking and being in the world together in a way that's going to help people, support people in their own journeys? And I think uh, just in my own readings of uh, Rollo, uh, there's so much of that there, and it's so. Uh, important, I think, in terms of how we we work, you know, to advance his legacy too. I, I agree with you. I mean, I don't think he's looking for groupies. He's looking, uh, you know, in that way of um, really advancing humanistic psychology uh, that takes psychology beyond uh, a different level. We were just talking before the show started, right? That there's this disturbing trend that seems to isolate psychology to a 
you know, a very few mechanistic processes, uh, you know, in terms of therapeutic interventions. And while we all agree and embrace that there should be multiple modalities in how we help people get well, losing that emphasis on the whole person, that existential approach, the humanistic approach, uh, seems to do a grave injustice to psychology. So, um, you know, we need more of the Edmund Delowitzes of the world coming out there to uh, take up the challenge of advancing a more narrative literary form of psychology that can help augment and complement psychology. Sorry, I got on a soapbox there, but you inspired me. No, uh, those those are worthy, worthy comments, Nathan. Um, one other concept to invoke, I think, in speaking about Rollo and his legacy is, is that of, of, of paradox, which was very important to him, even in the titles of many of his works, Love and Will, Freedom and Destiny, Power and Innocence. It's very interesting, isn't it, that he gives his biographer access to all his personal and dream journals. Though those are not um, oh, wholly flattering records. But I, I think this was a guy who wanted his his uh, more genuine struggle known to others. He, he was not looking um, for that kind of, uh, kind of false praise. Uh, if, if people were going to admire him, I think it was important to him that it, it, we did it for the right reasons, which is to say it was what in his um, uh, mind he made of his particular struggle to to see to get even a hint of that as a student you know um was really kind of both freeing for me and also it 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 uh, helped to better inform my own uh, sort of destiny as uh, somebody who um who would uh, have to sort of go my own way yeah, you know? sure. and, and having a, a kind of exemplar um made all the difference for me Absolutely. Absolutely. And I want to get into that uh, here as we uh, we're getting into the last few minutes of our interview today. Um, I think I've said this almost to every single guest and Ed, you're no exception. We could talk about Rollo and you for, for a couple hours. I mean, I, I just find you to be uh, a wealth of, of uh, interesting, engaging conversations. So really appreciate your time. For those of you that have heard uh Dr. Mendelowitz's mention of the biography, Dr. Robert Abzug uh, recently published a history on Rollo May. Again, that link will be in our show notes. You'll also find access, but simply type in Abzug, A-B-Z-U-G, in Amazon or in Google, and you can find that uh, along with the coupling of Rollo May in your search. So, Ed, I want to switch gears a little bit. I mean, Rollo has influenced you greatly in your own work and scholarship, and I want to hear about what you're doing, because you're you're sort of the, uh, in a way, uh, the kind of scholar I've always wanted to become when I grow up, uh, when I get out of presidenting it someday in my life, which I love. But, uh, you know, you've got that uh, nomadic yet uh, uh, really incredible way of connecting with people and institutions. What are you studying right now, aside from teaching? Uh, what's your primary focus of research and scholarship? Where do you see uh, Rollo coming in on these fronts, too? So, so I, I continue to to you know work part time as a, as a, a psychotherapist. I continue there to be hugely influenced uh, by by Rollo, although. As he liked to say, you know, that your, your, your most important uh, instrument is, as a therapist is your own person. And uh, so you're never off the, the hook of, of developing your own style and way. When Eugene Taylor years ago told me that story about Henry Murray and this literary psychology, I, I, I said to Eugene, I said, you know, that, that's what I do. And Eugene, this is what I loved about that guy. And he said, uh, he said, that's exactly what you do. He, he, he got it, you know. And so um, I think people like George, um, Bob Abzug, you know, uh, with, since the publication of the book, he and I have become um, really quite uh, good friends. Yeah, he really, he told me, he, he, I mentioned a few times in that book, and he says, I, I, I really appreciate your writing. And, and he said, you know, you have some sort of rare gift to integrate uh, ideas uh, in a way that, um, is not uh, circumscribed by academic academic minds, you know? And so I, I'd say it's more of a, I don't know, intuitive uh, 
slash literary mind. And I, yeah, I realize that my writing is important in some way. And so I, I, I consider myself an occasional essayist. It's hard work for me to write, and I don't feel like things should be put out at least for my for, with my name on it, you know, unless they contribute in some unique way to to what's out there. But I am in the process of of revising this um, this uh, book, which I published uh, in two thousand and eight. It was just a tiny academic press, but um, you know, and as usually happens, these things fall out of print at some point and uh, they've come back and they want to bring it back. And I, I want to as well, because it's a unique kind of work that is uh, collage-like, you know, uh, it, it pulls on all these different um, um, elements in, in, in meditating on character and also ethics, how one moves through the world, you know. So I, I'm 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 working on that these days now. It's it's interesting. That that was an essay that was maybe the very first paper I ever presented at an APA conference. It probably would have been like ninety nine. And then at a certain point I had made sort of big changes in my uh personal life. So I had been I pulled out of a, a practice at a certain point and just um essentially was not doing much of anything. And, um, and I, so I began developing this essay into a kind of book. And then I stopped. I thought no one's going to ever be interested in, in, in this. And then came 9-11. And you know, I just watched the news for some weeks, days. And I, I saw, as we see these days too, there, there's always a tendency to uh, cheapen the conversation to turn things into a kind of um, uh, a presumed uh, dualism. And at a certain point, I just had to sort of turn off the TV. And I went back to my writing table and I, I finished this, this book. And uh, so it's, it's a meditation on character and um, this idea that um, uh, Thoreau says someplace in his notebooks, I think, all of life is startlingly moral. And uh, in other words, we, we choose from moment to moment. You know, it's not like we're in the camp of the good and uh, we can just relax. We're, we're never off so the, true. the hook. So I think that um, this is my um, way of saying these things, you know. That's wonderful. So so if, if individuals are interested in finding this publication, what, what would they look so Give me a few months give me a few more months right, you know, they, you. they can they can go to academia.edu the academic site i believe you know you you, do, you can go there without an academic um appointment or um yeah. place and um i have a uh, sort of excerpt of the you know i'm, I'm working it's I'm, I'm trying to put it in a slightly perhaps more accessible way this time around but i i have a kind of uh excerpt you know uh, of it and people will get some idea about it one of the fascinating things about it is i i tell the story through that book of a young woman i was working with who was a bona fide what is called the dissociative identity disorder but multiple personality disorder and this is somebody who grew up uh, in a radically tortured home and uh had, was one of the is we remain in touch with one of the most fascinating and aware and tragic and funny figures I've, uh, I've ever known. And um, so I tell her a story because it's an ultimately spiritual and also uh, moral journey that, that she's been on uh, just, just merely to survive the brutal set of cards, you know, that, um, that the universe dealt her. Her dreams, her poems, her conversations with other so-called alters, uh, all of this is, is um, you know, interwoven into this larger text, you know, uh, in a way that, um, at least for some people, I think is is unique. That story alone, that just very small snippet, sounds incredibly uh, impactful and meaningful. And I, I, I look forward to reading it in the future. I really do. I hope you'll send me an advanced copy. I'll, I'll even pay for it, Ed, I promise. <laughs> no, 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 you, you, you deserve it. It's my, it's my pleasure. Well, as we kind of come to a close, you know, usually I ask all of my guests, what does humanistic mean to you? But I think you've just done like a 40-minute 
awesome lecture on what humanistic uh, psychology is. Is there anything else you want to add to that? Uh, any layering on that? And then I have one more question for you before we close. So I remember uh, going back to that class I took with Rallo uh, at the very onset, and uh, you know, I found myself volunteering fairly quickly to present a case. From, I was I was working, as I say, in a prison, and I was working with this um, a man about my age. Uh, he had a very violent uh, life story. He was a member of the, the Yurok tribe and uh, the Northwestern uh, tribe. And he and I became quite well. We we developed an unusual relationship where where he really me, and uh, I, I presented his story for my case. And here was a guy who was considered a psychopath. The, the supervisor told me, you won't learn anything. Uh, you won't change him at all, but you'll learn about psychopathy. Well, this guy was reading Camus and Nietzsche and writing with uh, instructors coming out from Berkeley. Nobody knew this because he didn't talk about it, you know? And, uh, but he gradually shared this stuff with me. And I read a story to Rollo. And that class had opened this way. He said, Ed is going to present tonight, but someone has asked me to say a few words about the differences between existentialism and phenomenology. And uh, he said a few words about this, but he said, I don't find these conversations very interesting or very existential these days. He, he wanted to get beyond the, the, the sort of lexicon, you know, and the, the paradigm. Sure. And uh, at the end of the evening, after reading even this, uh, this short uh, story that this um, inmate had written, Rallo said, uh, he said, you know, this man writes very well. He said, he writes better than many of us. <laughs> and then he said, what I'd like to say uh, is that this is existential therapy. And I, I, I thought to myself, boy, this is, uh, I was maybe 28 at the time, Nathan. I, I thought this is probably one of the best compliments or most meaningful that I'm ever going to receive. And what he was doing is simply saying, you weren't uh, trying to presume how you were helping. You were telling a story that in which you were integral to that story. And um, it's that sort of mysterious encounter and unfolding that occurs uh, both. It can occur in therapy. It can occur certainly in uh, the uh, teaching relationship. That's also the thing that we're especially trying to um, uh, to underscore and to, to keep alive. Beautiful. All right, Dr. Mendelowitz, uh, one last final question. And th this is the three things. You ready? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, with all that's out there, with the challenges in the world, what are three things, three simple things people can do right now to improve their mental health? As my client says in that book, you know, my dissociative, uh, there are many ways it can go, okay? Uh, but I, I, I would say, uh, first of all, a kind of um, honoring, even a kind of a recognition of the sacro sacrosanct nature of truth. I don't mean the truth. I mean the, the concern for truth. And I think that always involves a kind of internal uh, struggle. And I think that um, the outward uh, politic that comes out of that is also just as essential. The, 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 um, the movement, you know, the, the, the politics, the, the sort of standing up for what is right. The first thing I would say is, um, you know, the, the, the concern for truth uh, and also the encounter with one's struggle, picking up of one's, part, Buber calls it one's particular way. You and I, we each have our own uh, scriptures, uh, you know, lines from the scripture that are handed to us, right? And, uh, I, you know, we, we know each other uh, somewhat, but I see you on your own kind of journey. And I, I don't know all the, the, the details therein, but, you know, the, the movement, I think, is the thing that's important. And then finally, and these days especially, is, is hope. I'm working on that introduction to the uh, republication, readaptation of my book. And I uh, sort of close with a quote from William James, where he talks about um, the human predicament. And what he's saying is, uh, suppose someone offered you this challenge of a, uh, a better possible place we as a world might get to. But 
the, the, the outcome was not guaranteed. We don't know where we're heading. Mm -hmm. Will you take up this challenge, you know, and do your level best to affect this possibility? I think this, this sort of hope, it is not naive, but requires courage, uh, is, um, is going to be on my short list of, um, of, of virtues. Hope, concern for truth. And how do we frame that third one, Ed? I, I want to make sure I get this right for our audience. I think the other part of it has to be commitment, some kind of um, movement, one sort of creative uh, work in one's own life. So, it's, you know, a, a place like Saybrook at, attracts a certain sort of set of uh, individuals. To some extent, individuals that would be less easy uh, to uh, content themselves, you know, in, in some more conventional realm. And uh, so that involves the, the sort of responsibility, you know, uh, and Rollo likes to define that word response dash ability. Very good. Very good. So, so hopefully it'll be fair to position it as the Ed Mandelowitz's three things. It would be concern for truth. Uh, a commitment to one's path and a response ability uh, to the life they're living, and three, maintaining and pursuing hope. Is that fair? I think so. We'll work on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, I personally, very honestly, I find myself wrestling with that. Uh, sure. With, with those, those themes these days, you know. Well, Ed, thank you so much. Uh, we are just thrilled that you could join us today. Before you go, uh, do you have any books, articles, recordings you want to direct people towards uh, outside of academia.edu? Do I have 30 seconds to tell a short story or, two, two, or, or no? Sure, sure. Real quick. So, so I, I once, uh, when I had I was happily single uh, on, on the East Coast and much more free time in my hand, I would often go to the Harvard Film Archives at uh, Harvard University, and at one point I ran into this Polish filmmaker of animated films, and I could tell he was making films about Kafka, Dostoevsky. I could tell the European filmmakers he was influenced by, and he and I chatted afterward. A, few, a week or so later, I'm wandering down uh, through the Mass Ave and Harvard Square. I run into him. We recognize each other. We have a coffee together. It's the only conversation we ever shared, but he knew I was a psychologist. And he said, so who's in your pantheon? You know, I mean, who would you recommend reading? He was, and I thought he was talking about Freud and Jung. And so I spoke a little bit about Otto Rank. And um, then he said to me, the one um, I am most um, blown away by is Rollo May. And I, I, I froze. I said, that was my teacher. And he said, I was reading on the flight over from Warsaw, uh, Polish Translation of Freedom and Destiny, hmm. uh, one of Rollo's later works. And um, he said, as soon as I got to Cambridge, he lost the, the book on the flight. He says he had to reorder it again. And so Rollo once told me he considered it a plagiarism of himself because he was repeating stuff he'd already said before. And for an, a creative mind like that, you don't have time to waste. You know, I think that it's a, a lovely overview of this paradoxical kind of uh, tension that, uh, as one reviewer said uh, at the time, you, you never come away from um, a Rollo May book without believing that uh, life is worth the candle. Beautiful. And so, so that's what I mean by it. it's that kind of, we can call it existential hope. Very good. Well, thank you for leaving us with that bit of wisdom. You can find Dr. Mendelowitz at saybrook.edu. You can find him probably all over the web. And most importantly, I think you've got uh, some amazing material here to keep you busy and thinking and deep diving into Rollo May's legacy and psychology for years to come. Dr. Mendelowitz, thank you so, so much. Uh, Nathan, thank you. Really, I appreciate it. Ed, Dr. Mendelowitz, thank you again for what can be described as a powerful interview. Fabulous stuff, sir. I hope all of you enjoyed Ed as much as I did, including his reminiscences about Rollo May. Uh, he left us with a lot of great wisdom, especially around humanistic psychology and existentialism. I hope you'll take a moment to read his book, his essay, and also Dr. May's materials. If you want to see the video elements, we've created these segments available on our Saybrook University YouTube channel and on social media. 
If you would like to support the podcast, go to Apple iTunes and leave a five-star rating and review and subscribe so you can get episodes as they come out. If you're on Spotify, leave that five-star rating and make sure to follow us. You can, of course, subscribe to us on most major podcast platforms, including Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Pandora, and my favorite, Pocket Casts. Remember to check our show notes for information on today's guest, including links to websites, books, etc. And for more about our psychology program or the university, go to www.saybrook.edu. Click on Areas of Study at the top of the page and locate the program to learn more. Or simply Google Saybrook University Psychology Program. Take care, everyone. Be well.